I thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to be here and to share with you the Word of God. It's always a delight. It's one of the highlights of my year, and I enjoy being with you, and I hope to continue the renewed fellowship and friendship that we have after the meeting tonight. Now, our subject tonight is Daniel 6, and um, in organizing the material and uh, the presentation, it could be done in a number of different ways. Um, and I'm saying this, and it will become apparent later why I'm saying this. Um, we could look at chapter 6 of Daniel as a manual of devotion for the Christian, um, or as a guide for true, responsible, national leadership. That would be legitimate. Um, Thirdly, it could be a warning and, uh, concerning persecution, um, an instruction in the providence of God. Also, we could look at a contrast between God's special grace in the chapter and God's common grace in the chapter. Or we could look at it as a wonderful, uh, glorious, divine mir miracle. Um, all these would be legitimate, um, and it would be a, a legitimate use of the passage for our mutual edification. However, I've decided tonight, um, although the message on the magazine says, Daniel in the lion's den, I want to look at more what led to the lion's den. So, first of all, introduction. You've all heard of the proverb, familiarity breeds contempt. And that can be used in a lot of context. But you know, the reverse is also true. Unfamiliarity also leads to contempt. Let me illustrate what I mean by this from an experience from my early Christian life. Our pastor had invited um, the editor of a well-known reformed magazine to come to our church and speak. And I think all of us were expecting something very deep and very profound and very meaty. Um, he chose this passage, chapter 6 of Daniel. Um, I had just been a believer of about three years standing. And there was a woman in the church. She was 83 years old, but the Lord had only saved her two years earlier. Marvellous, at the end of her life. She'd been a teacher in her life, so quite an educated woman. Um, so at the end of the message, I asked her what she thought of the message, knowing who brought the message. And she said to me, well, it was a children's story. And you know, this troubled me for a while. In fact, a long while. And it colored my views concerning this passage. You see, her familiarity with Daniel in the lion's den and it being used as a children's story in school and she'd probably taught it had led to her unfamiliarity with the rest of the chapter. So beware sometimes when someone asks you your opinion that it's not something that's going to be to the detriment of the one that asks the question. Find something positive to give in every passage of Scripture. Now, there is no doubt whatsoever that a very divine and notable and great miracle, in fact, one of the great miracles, I don't know how you can categorize miracles, but if you could, this must be one of the top ten. It is a great miracle. And we're not detracting from that by looking at what brought Daniel to the den. Now, let's look at the context of um, Daniel chapter 6. It, 
the, the thoughts of Daniel 6 must be understood in the context of the whole book. And the book of Daniel, when it comes down to it, is twofold. It's a manual of prophetic um, truths which God has revealed to individuals of what must yet come to pass. That is without doubt, and that's what the other speakers are bringing out from this platform over the, the, the what well, will well, before in the, in the preceding months and in the succeeding months also. Ja Daniel 6 is crouched in the middle and it brims with instructions and illustrations on both defensive and offensive strategies for the Christian armory. It's for us to use offensively and defensively in our Christian lives, in this one aspect. And that brings us to the other side of the coin, the one that we're going to be looking at tonight. Because the other side of this chapter reveals the extent and the length which the powers of darkness, led by the prince of the powers of darkness, and his anti-God and anti-Christian followers will stoop to in their war against the sons and daughters of light. The book of Daniel then is not about a book about the, the people of God in the land of God, but the people of God outside the land of God. Let me bring that into a modern illustration. In today's language, Daniel 6 is a manual for you, not how to live in the gathered assembly of the church, but as you go from the gathered assembly out into the secular world. That's what Daniel 6 gives us. It gives us this manual of instruction of how we should live in this present evil world. How we should live, how we should respond, how we should deal with people. Daniel 6 is a microcosm of the whole of the book. So, today, I'm sure you're familiar with, you can't turn on your radio or your television or pick up a newspaper without reading about what is happening to our family. And I mean the extended family. What is happening in Iraq today, in Syria today, in Egypt today, in uh, Ethiopia today, in Eastern Europe today, in Islamic countries today, our brethren are being systematically persecuted. They are being persecuted more now, I believe, than since the Great Reformation of the 16th and 17th century. Now I know you're not experiencing that. And I'm not experiencing that. We go out into the world and we tell someone about Jesus. And they say to you, at one time they might have taken offense. But not so much now. You tell them about Jesus, they say, oh that's okay for you. That's fine for you. If you like that, if that's for your living, you do that. But I'll just go on my way. So if there's any persecution that we receive nowadays, whether we be in our place of occupation or in our street where we live or in our extended family, it's very mild. But we have brothers and sisters that are dying, paying the supreme price. And if they're not dying, then they're being hounded from their homes. Their goods have been taken from them. In Egypt, if you're a Christian, you're a second-class citizen. You have no rights to, to hold office, to go to a university, to um, have a place of responsibility in the community or in the national life. 
Chapter 6 of Daniel explains the reasons why. Because there is a sustained persecution of all the people of God. We should take heed. Because although the persecution now may be mild, our freedoms are being taken from us through national legislation. Christians who own guest house and baker shops are being marginalised and persecuted. And this is going to continue. This is going to increase. And Daniel 6 explains how this will increase and why this will increase. It's a very important chapter on the persecution of the believer. It teaches us what we should expect if we live faithful lives in Christ Jesus. But it also is a chapter of comfort to know that through this difficult persecution that the believer knows that he walks with his Lord and his Lord walks with him. Now, how are we going to look at this paper tonight? We're going to look at this passage um, first of all, I, I want to do two things tonight. There is a main part to the paper which is going to take up most of our time. And at the end, I want to spend maybe five, six, seven minutes on two other sub-subjects which are not really related to what our thoughts are tonight but are still important and we, I felt we should bring them out tonight. I've heard one other person that has done this once before, a number of decades ago. Um, so I'll try the same tonight. So we've got a main part of the paper, and then just if you'll indulge me, seven or eight minutes at the end, we shall look at two other aspects. So, the first aspect we're going to look at is the organisation of the empire. Secondly, the organisation of enmity. Thirdly, the organization of the earnest believer, and fourthly, the organization of our eternal God. So first of all, the organization of the empire. You will notice that when um, Paul, our chairman tonight, uh, read the first three verses, it gives the organization of the empire. Now, I believe, and I'm open to be challenged on this, but I believe that it's apparent from the passage that the early verses of chapter 6 do not follow sharply on from chapter 5 of Daniel. The reasons I believe this, firstly, are that Darius has quite a, 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 a strong understanding of Daniel himself. Darius knows his nature. He knows his character. He knows Daniel's trustworthiness. And he knows Daniel's faithfulness. That doesn't come overnight. That is by watching someone, looking at someone. Daniel, Darius has taken over this empire. He's one of the most powerful men of the time. He can do almost anything as long as it's, as we've seen tonight, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. But he can do almost anything. He's controlled by law. an empire. He's maybe kept the old government for a while. And he's observed them. And as he's observed them, he has found in Daniel a man truly different and truly remarkable. A man that does not fit into the jigsaw pattern of his thinking. A man that could be easily manipulated, corrupted, changed, molded. But a man who has principles based upon his view of God. Darius knows this. That whatever Daniel is, he is because of who he trusts in. His Lord, his God and his master. Darius knows this. 
He knows that his character, that Daniel's character and nature is shaped according to his view of his Lord. And I believe that this has to be built up over a period of time. Then, as our brother read earlier, we find the cabinet reshuffle. Now, we've just had one of these, haven't we, in our country? And we all know what that is. People getting maybe their, their job back again, some getting a new job, some moved upward, some moved downward, some moved sideways, some moved out altogether. And that's what this is. It's a cabinet reshuffle here. Darius's kingdom is described in five ways um, in this chapter. It's called the kingdom. He calls it then his whole kingdom. He calls it his whole realm. And then he describes it even more. It is in verse 25. All peoples, nations, languages in all the earth. You see the grand view that this man has of himself? He is master of everything he surveys. But he knows that this kingdom, according to verse 26, is diverse. Every dominion of my kingdom. So he knows that there are different nationalities, languages, cultures. And he wants to have these organized. That's why we have this organization here at the beginning of the book. Darius realizes that if he wants to have a, a, a real kingdom and a powerful kingdom and a successful kingdom, he must have good organization. Business knows that today. Ask anyone in business and they will say that one of the greatest things is organization. Personal organization, departmental organization and company organization. That is the secret to success. Darius knows this. But don't think that he's doing it for the benefit of the people or even for the benefit of the officials that he's about to appoint. Because verse 2, at the end of verse 2, tells us the real reason why he's doing all this. Because he doesn't want to have any damage. He wants to get the maximum that he can of commerce and trade and, and uh, if he's got his armies organized, um, bringing in the gold and the silver and so on. He doesn't want any loss. That's what he's here for. He's, he's a, a ruthless businessman. So that is why he puts this um, new cabinet in place. Now, those of you that have studied business or have been part of business, you will know about the, the pyramid of authority. At the top of the pyramid, you have the chief executive officer. That's Darius. And then, underneath, you have to have subdivisions, senior managers, junior managers, and, and heads of department. And that's what he's doing. All so that he will not receive any damage in this new um, kingdom. So he's at the top of the pyramid. The next level down is the man he has been observing, Daniel. He is the one because he knows that this man is truly trustworthy, a man that cannot be manipulated or bribed or used even by Darius. That's important. And then under him, two presidents. And then under the two presidents, there are um, um, 120 princes. I presume that these are parts of the dominions mentioned in verse 26 of my kingdom. So 120 um, um, uh, princes. And then below them, it's not mentioned in, ch in the first three verses, but in, ch in, ver in chapters at verse 7, it mentions another three groups. Governors, counselors, captains. And then underneath them you have the empire. Or in the words of Darius, all the peoples, nations, languages in all the earth. So, this Daniel is known by Darius. 
So he chooses him for the chief position. Very shrewd move at that time. Now, let's move on to our next section. Organization of the enmity. This covers verses 4 through 17. We have here, um, first of all, wicked jealousy. And it always happens. And I'm sure you have been watching. Uh, I um, was watching the, the election prior to the election and, and then the evening of the election because um, I'm quite interested in what happens in, in our country. And um, everyone seems to be very nice to one another. And then all of a sudden, things seem to go wrong. The next day, the fingers get pointed. So-and-so said such. And this is so-and-so's fault. And it, this is what is happening here. Now, there is a united thinking here in verse 4. Notice, it's the presidents, the princes, together. 122 people. Now, if you've got two people against you, that's not very good odds. Think of it in terms of an army, 2,000 against 1,000. Not good odds. Think of the persecution here. 122 to 1. Now, we're not betting people. But we know that 122 to 1 is a figure that we wouldn't like to have. If we went into a, a doctor's office and he said, um, I'm sorry, but you've got a, a terminal disease. But there is one hope. But it's only one hope in 122 he still wouldn't be leaving with a smile. It's odds that you do not want to have. So, what did they do? Well, they sought to find something against Daniel himself. And what did they find? Well, it's the same as is always found. Don't know if you know the story of... Um, I think it's William Grimshaw of Haworth. He was a, a godly man, I believe, um, Methodist, and um, very righteous man. And um, his enemies tried to find something against him, but they couldn't find anything against him concerning his preaching or his teaching. Um, so they made up a story that he stole a pig. You know? And, and it's one of those stories that's his word against someone else's word. Um, and we might laugh at that nowadays, you know. It, he stole a pig. Um, but this is the same problem that these people have with Daniel. All they can find against him are negatives. And it's all found in verse 4. They, they could find no occasion against him. They could no, find no fault in him. Neither was there any error found in him. You see, when they're attacking someone, they can find nothing against the true and faithful person of God. In fact, the only thing that they can find against him, positively is a positive thing which is for Daniel because again in verse 4 they said for as much as he was faithful so you see we have here a wonderful illustration of a faithful testimony if we will stand firm people will find nothing against us it will only be negatives so something has to be concocted against the true people of God. Notice their united planning. There was a united 
jealousy, there was a united wickedness, and now there is a united planning. And in general terms, they were not able to deal with Daniel as an administrator. That's something they couldn't do. They probably knew, although the text doesn't tell us, but they probably knew that Darius had a fondness for him. And that was probably mutual. So, they can only deal with Daniel as a person. Except we find something, verse 5, against him. Concerning the law of his God, or literally that means the law of his religion. That's somewhere they could get him. And you know, do you see what they're doing here? They're not jealous that Daniel's a successful administrator, that he's good at what he does, that he is successful in what he does, that he's a good planner, that he's a good organiser, that he does all things well. They are against him as an individual because of who he is and who he believes in. And that is what we have today against us. They're not caring about how successful or how rich or how famous we may be. They are against you because of who you trust in. The Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 6 of Daniel is a wonderful illustration of that. It's a, it gives us this reason that why they hate us is because of the Lord whom they hate also, and his divine standards. So they they concoct now a particular plan, an evil plan. Notice how they came in verse 7 to Darius. Notice there, the first thing after they have have mollycoddled him in verse 6 and uh, closely come up to him and made him feel good, the first thing that they say is a lie. All the presidents? <laughs> no, not all the presidents. Daniel has been brought in, but he was not part of this. So the first thing that they say is a lie. And so the powers of darkness, we must remember, are always liars. Remember the, the, the wicked one? He was a liar and a liar from the beginning. And that has gone right through the ages. All those who are of the wicked one are liars because they do not have the truth that is in Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They do not want the truth. So they begin with a lie. The governors, princes, councillors, captains, all these together, they've consulted together. And it's a very clever thing that they do. They make a proposal that whosoever makes a petition of any god or man, that is the proposal. Whosoever shall do that. And then they put a duration on it because then they've got to think about their own wicked ways. We can do without worshipping our our gods for 30 days. But we still want to go back to them. So they put a duration on it because they know that they, with their wickedness and their sinful lives, can do that. They can put it aside. But the believer can't. Daniel can't. He must be faithful day in, day out. Because he is following the Lord Not through obedience, but through love. That is the difference. A proposal, a duration, and then they put on it uh, a restriction. Yes, a petition can be made, but must be made to you, O Darius. Again, calling favour. To him. And then, of course, the great penalty. The 
penalty for, for not following this is that they will be cast into the den of lions. And so the king, Julie, has to do what they ask. They need the, the verification, the verification factor. They need Darius to do this. And Darius, of course, does this. Naively so, I believe. Very naively so. Not realizing that he is being reeled into a trap. He may have had suspicions. He doesn't know the knock-on effect. He's not party of this wicked plan that was beforehand. He doesn't know that Daniel is the one that is being targeted. He may have his suspicions. We don't know. So the king signs it and the decree is formalized. So, we find then that what is inevitable, we expect it. The powers of darkness will always find a way against the people of God. So, they observe Daniel, and Daniel, we shall see in just a moment when we, when we come to that aspect, um, continues to do faithfully as he'd always done. Let us now turn to Daniel. This is now the organization of the earnest believer. Daniel now knows what has happened. And Daniel, like all of us have from time to time, come to have to make a decision. What am I going to do here? Shall I modify? Shall I change? Shall I compromise a little? We know it is here that, and it's no accident, in that little scripture text there, it says, he did as he did aforetime. Daniel doesn't change anything that he has done before. Nothing. He does exactly the same. Now, what would we might do today if we were threatened with that? Well, we might buy one of those pit bull terriers. Or we might buy a, 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 a security system, an alarm on the house. We might buy cameras that are monitoring people coming up and down our street. We might buy a few extra bolts for the door. We might do our devotions differently from before. Still do them, but in a different way. Behind a closed door. What does Daniel do? Well, verse 10 tells us that he did as he had always done. He went into his house. Now that's where we should do our devotions privately. In our home. And then he goes into his chamber. It's always good. Remember I mentioned at the beginning that Daniel 6 might be used legitimately as a manual of devotion. Well, this passage here is an example of it. Um, it's always good to have a settled location for our devotions rather than a, um, um, different places here and there. Now, I know it's difficult for some people. Some people have to travel for a living and uh, some people might be in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, um, be with different people, with different believers. Um, but it's always good to have a settled location for our devotions, a familiar place, a place where we know that this is um, for us. I know it was for um, when having young children. Having young children, it's always good to teach them that when daddy or mummy goes into that room, that's where they're not to be disturbed because that is the, 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 the settled location. That's the private place where they meet with God. Okay, he opens his windows towards Jerusalem. But he had always done this. 
He was a man who was in a secular society. He knew where he came from and he looked towards that place um, because it had been the place um, where God had placed his temple. It had been the, the, the presence of God above the mercy seat um, in the Holy of Holies within the temple. For Daniel, that was important. That was important. He falls to his knees. He humbles himself. He doesn't change. He doesn't have guards round about him. Which he could have done in his position. He humbles himself on his knees before the Lord. And he's habitual. He does this three times a day. Now just imagine if it's, this had happened to us. We might say, well, cut it down to one. And I'll maybe wait until it's dark. But not Daniel. Daniel is doing what he did before time. It's exactly the same as he did before. He makes no new arrangements. This is the wonderful thing about the believer's private life with his Lord. It's the sameness of it. It's the habitual practice of it. And then he prays. The scripture tells us, pray, praying is always at its base dependency upon another. Dependency upon the Lord. He gives thanks. We could elaborate on these points. He gives thanks. And he's totally unselfish because he makes supplications for others. Probably for the very people who are standing outside his balcony with their binoculars trained upon him. He's praying for them. He did not change his habit or practice. That's this wonderful thing about this, this chapter here. In the midst of persecution. I don't know if any of you received the Barnabas magazine. But that speaks a, the, as a voice in this country for the persecuted church in the persecuted countries. And you will find that these people, okay, we can understand. People leaving their homes, going to the borders, um, going into camps. Uh, refugee camps, that is. Um, we can understand taking certain measures under certain very difficult persecutions. Um, and it's easy for us sitting here comfortably tonight, pointing the finger and saying, well, we shouldn't do that. We should do what Daniel did. Daniel is the pattern, yes. And for Daniel, that was right. For us, it may well be so too. But we find the testimonies in the Barnabas magazine of these people is that they still meet together for worship. They still have their pastors. They still look after the less fortunate amongst them. And who could be less fortunate than themselves? But yet still, they're charitable towards others. Still they continue their devotions. The marvelous testimony to us Western Christians living in the comfort that we do live in today. But as we would expect, Daniel is discovered. That was inevitable. That was always going to be the case because Daniel wasn't ring fenced. He wasn't totally protected, humanly speaking. He made himself vulnerable by his faithfulness. But what better accolade in life than leaving ourselves vulnerable by being faithful? The assembled come together. They find Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. We can just see them rubbing their hands. This is what we expected and this is what we've got. Daniel is now informed of. 
But you know, how deceitful. He's a liar from the beginning, the wicked one, and his people also, but deceitful also. Notice, in verse 5, it was their idea. The idea was theirs. Nothing to do with Darius. Their consultation in verse 7, it was theirs, and it was their insistence, and they went to Darius, and they forced this thing upon him to establish it with the, the royal decree and to make a confirmation of it. But you'll notice in verse 12, when these people come to Darius, that the table is now turned. They put the onus on Daniel, on Darius. They say, oh Darius, your decree, it's your decree that, that, that has been desecrated here. The one that, that you signed, the one that you um, um, sealed with, their, with, your, with your signet ring. It, it, it's yours. And then they, they put the, the knife in, as it were, as Brutus did to Caesar. Um, Hast thou not signed? So they put it fairly squarely at Darius' feet there. This is where Darius realizes now that he's been duped. He knows that the man that he knew and loved and respected, the man that he believed who could control the whole kingdom, was being set up. And being set up, he was now found guilty. And by his own hand. Because according to verses 12 and 15 in, verse, in, in chapter 6, the nature of the Medo-Persian law is that once it was ratified, they could not go back on it. You see how clever the powers of darkness are? How clever? Remember when we mentioned the duration? They could suspend their religious life for 30 days. So they made it 30 days. That's why that's important in the passage. Medo-Persian law. And that law controlled not just the common man, but also the rulers the leaders of that pyramid that we mentioned and the one at the top of the pyramid, the chief executive officer, Darius. It affects all of them. Such a contrast from a few chapters earlier with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had no such limitations. He was an, an absolute monarch. But not Darius. He was held by these laws. So their action there, uh, their accusation of Daniel was too pronged. That Daniel uh, does not regard the king personally. So they tried to rub it in here. This is where they can make it look bad for Daniel. He, he does not regard you personally. After all the favoritism that you've shown him, this is how he repays you. This is the way it's going. That's the first prong. The second prong is that, that Daniel does not regard the law of the Medes and the Persians, which for them was almost sacred law. So Daniel is informed of. So what happens here? This is what leads Daniel to the den of lions. He's on the threshold of this now. It's the powers of darkness behind the scenes, but visibly in the human rulers and officers of the time. They come against one individual. You know the unusual thing about this, about this whole persecution, is that normally it comes from the top. Normally, as we've seen in past toppled dictatorships, as we saw in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, the head of the clan, his evil purposes filtered down through all the rest of the officers and sub-officers out into the land. 
The same with Colonel Gaddafi in Egypt, with his clan. But there's no, there's no antichrist here in Darius. This is the unusual thing about this whole passage, is that behind the scenes there is something greater and grander and more powerful happening. It's the work of God. And that brings us into our final section, the organization of the eternal God. Our God saw to it that Daniel had a favored benefactor. Because when, when Daniel was accused and Darius knew what he must do and what must happen, that he must be put away to that den of lions. But first of all, he was displeased. He was displeased. Now that's unusual for a supreme ruler. Wanting to save one righteous individual. He knew that he'd been deceived. He knew that he had been deceived because of jealous and disloyal officials. But he knew that he was bound by Medo-Persian law. Secondly, he tried to deliver. He set his heart on Daniel. Now you can see why um, um, I mentioned at the beginning that there had to be a time when Darius and Daniel got to know each other very well. A relationship had to have been built up. But behind the scenes, it was the Lord God working in the life of Darius to make him favorable towards Daniel. But we see in all of this that the deliverance has nothing to do with Darius. That's not why there was a, 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 a favorable benefactor. The favorable benefactor was there because of what happens afterwards. After Daniel was released from the den, the, the benefactor knows exactly what he has to do. And we see the consequences of that. And significantly, the next cabinet reshuffle that he has is at the den of lions when he um, deals with his cabinet in one fell sweep and not just the, the officials, but um, uh, wives and children and extended family also. Um, but however, he set his heart to, to deliver Daniel. And it, it gives us the impression in the passage that, that um, he is given time by the other officials. It seems that I get the impression, reading the passage, that they seem to go away and come back when it's evening because Darius tries to, um, from, from the time um, of, of the daylight hours when this is brought to his attention, he tries in various ways how he can get round this law of the Medes and the Persians, which he knows he can't, but he tries anyway. And they come to him in the evening and um, then he has to give up. Daniel to the den. So Daniel is cast into that den of lions. In a room in my house, I have a, a print that I got from Sweden, or oh, must be about 35 years ago. And it's a picture of Daniel. He is standing there in a long black robe. The designer has made him without hair, obviously trying to give the appearance of age. And there's a window there. And there's, the beams of light are coming in that window. And Daniel is just standing there and he's looking up. And prowling around him are male and female lions looking at Daniel and getting the impression that they are pacing round about him. That these animals are hungry is in no doubt because that's what these animals were kept for. They were kept for the hunt, for the animal hunt. You see that in the British Museum on the, on the, the tiles and the walls there. There was the lion hunt, which 
the king was uh, supreme hunter and uh, the lion would be herded into an area where it would be fairly safe for the king to use his bow to kill it. Um, these animals were often kept hungry. And they were hungry because we know from verse 26, when the second cabinet reshuffle is, is, is enacted, that these lions are, are, are chomping before these people even reach the, the, the ground inside the, um, the, the den. However, we anticipate that. Darius has a sleepless night. Here we have an insight into a typical evening for a king. It would seem, um, according to verse um, um, 14, after the sun had gone down, um, according to verses 14 and verse 18, that Darius would spend his night in some kind of feasting. It would be feasting with some accompanying entertainment in his own house, probably with um, his extended family and maybe sometimes the extended officials, although I think on this particular occasion I don't think they would be there. However, eating, drinking, music and the like um, gives us the impression of a typical uh, Medo-Persian evening for a king. However, this routine is now dramatically changed by the events which are clearly out of his control. He's not feasting. He's alone. He, this is something different. He's alone. There's no feasting, no entertainment, no friends, no family, nothing. Probably an earlier night, but no sleep for him. Probably a longer night for him, but lots of worry. Probably an earlier start to the day than normal, but an unusual night for him. So that gives us a little insight into Persian life. But then we have an insight into the mind of this man. He's worried, genuinely worried. See the mar marvellous workings of our God? who can work in the life of such an individual that he was worried, really worried about Daniel. If he wasn't, he would have just gone to bed, taken a few drinks of wine and gone to sleep early, but he didn't. He was worried. It was real concern there. I get the impression he was frantic, probably pacing the room. He knew in his mind that he'd been deceived. And he knew who the deceivers were. And he knew the extent of the deception. And he knew that one man, one man, one faithful individual, one Christ-like individual, is worth more than all of these other officers, presidents, princes, counselors, and captains. One is worth much more. He's restless. Verse 19 gives us impression. He's urgent to, to, to know what's going to happen here. Verse 20, he's highly emotional. He's, he's crying with a lamentable voice. When's the last time we heard that from one of our leaders? Our leaders have been sniping at each other over the past um, few months. Um, Cat calling, cat calling names and, and, uh, and saying things and sometimes the things are true and sometimes they're not true and sometimes they put out a rumour and the rumour gathers arms and legs and it's difficult to deny it and, but by the time it's found that it's wrong, the damage is done. You know the thing I mean. Um, Darius is truly feeling for Daniel. However, we find in verses 21 through 23 that Daniel is delivered from the lion's den. Notice there, it's a matter, it's, it, there's a mutual respect there in these verses. When Darius calls out, 
Daniel replies, there's a mutual respect, the one for the other. Daniel respects the office, as we must always do as believers. Respect the office of the one who is in charge. Elected or otherwise in some countries. But it's also a matter of faith. He believed in his God. God sent his angel and God shut the lion's mouths. You know, there's always been a little um, dispute, maybe not, not debate, dispute. Um, that children's song, God just shut the lion's mouths. Um, now I believe that. But some believe that, that it was faith, that, that Daniel's faith that closed the lion's mouth. Well, no doubt it was Daniel's faith that God acted upon. But God closed the lion's mouths. Um, no human individual can do that. The lions didn't hurt him, verse 23. The innocency of Daniel before God's eyes. You know, that verse 23 we might be one of the first verses that would give us an indication of justification by faith. Because innocency was found in Daniel. And that is what justification is. That we have been justified before God. Now that does not make us perfect. It does not make us even sinless. It does not make us uh, or prevent us from sinning. But it's a judicial act which God the Father pronounces upon those that are his that they are justified by faith. And that is what is happening in that verse there. Daniel has been justified by his was totally protected. Now you see the difference in Darius. Glad, <laughs> verse 23, glad did you say? He was exceedingly glad. Almost at the same voice, commanding Daniel to be released, taken out and totally unharmed. Now, on the other hand, Darius now fulfills his job as chief executive officer. He must deal with the evil and with the deception. And he doesn't deal with it piecemeal. There is no trial. So there's not a democracy here. There's no trial. Because he knew exactly the situation. He'd spent that whole night, the night before, considering this. Along with all the worry he had for Daniel, he thought, if Daniel is freed, what do I do next? He knew what he was going to do next. And it was um, a capital crime. He, that's how he looked upon this whole thing. They had accused Daniel. That was a crime. A righteous man, an innocent man, proved not only the night before when he realized he'd been deceived by them, but also proved when Daniel appeared out of the den. That was another vindication of the fact that it was God that delivered this individual. So, they're cast into the den of lions. Punishment indeed fitted the crime in this case. And, of course, we can see the urgency of the lions. Right, just one or two conclusions on this part before we look at the one or two things. Um, the conclusion for us that we need to expect in the way of opposition, that opposition will be there. Now, I know at the moment it may be mild for us. But the closer we live to the Lord, the more there will be persecution. And if we suffer persecution, it will not because we're not doing our job right, 
or we're not saying the right things or doing the right things, it will be because we are being honest in our lives. We're being honest to the Lord who has saved us from our sins. That is what will be disliked. It's not the other things you do in life. But you must be faithful. We must be faithful in our place in our, as a neighbour, as, 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 a, as a, a father or a mother. Uh, um, uh, um, in business, we must be faithful. We must seek the ways of truth. We must be honest. And we must say that at times, even though people will not like what we say, and we know that they won't like what, what we say. We must say, well, we'll not do that because that is dishonest. We'll not do that because it's deceitful. We will not do that because the customer will be the one that suffers. We must be prepared to do things like that, based upon our trust in the Lord, knowing the truth is not all. But acting upon the truth is. Acting and believing the truth must go hand in hand. Another conclusion from the passage is that we must know that we have to endure these things. Daniel knew that he had to go into that den. He knew it. And he did it. And he came through. What a wonderful vindication also for Daniel. But it's also to know that behind the scenes, the Lord is there every step of the way. He controls the wickedness of these people so far, but no further. They wanted the death of Daniel. They wanted him in the den. They got him in the den, but no death. So far, but no further. The Lord behind the scenes. What if Daniel had done exactly the same and got out of the den and he didn't have a benefactor like Darius? Well, they might have thrown him back in again for a month, the whole 30 days. But behind the scenes, the Lord has a, 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 a human benefactor and sometimes help can come to you and I from the least expected source. I'm sure uh, I've experienced that and I'm sure you've experienced that as well. That there has been an ally somewhere where you've least expected it and may not even have been a believer. But yet they've been there to be an ally, to say the right thing, to support at the right time. Behind the scenes the Lord is always there. And then um, another conclusion is Daniel's prosperity. So this Daniel, verse 28, prospered in the reign of Darius, verse 28, in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. But we could also include here in his previous service in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, chapters 1 through 4, and in the reign of Belshazzar, chapters 5, 7, and eight. Daniel, because of his faithfulness, prospered. So that's a great encouragement for you and I that there is persecution, but then behind the persecution we have support. Now, just briefly, just two small things that I want to mention before we close. Um, first of all, um, it's the remarkable understanding of God from Darius, both before and after Daniel is delivered. You know, when I, when I wrote this down here, I have something like you know, 12 points. When I wrote this down here, I wondered how many supposed Christians have such a knowledge as Darius did. According to verse 16, um, he he knew that Daniel's God was a personal God. That Daniel knew him personally. And Darius understands that and believes that. 
that's probably one of the things that endeared him to Daniel. He also knows that God is a God to be served, verses 16 and 20. And that is why he understands Daniel and Daniel's life and Daniel's practice. That it's not just a man who believes in a God, but a man who serves this God also. Oh, that that might be said of you and I, that he or she not only believed in God, but served that God also. Darius knew this. He also knew, um, according to verse 10, 11 and 13, that God is a God, Daniel's God, who hears prayer. Now he must have wondered because he must have prayed to his false deity and heard and, 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 and received no answers to prayer. But he knows that Daniel's God hears prayer and also answers prayer. Now, we find that out afterwards because in verse 16, he says to Daniel, your God, he will deliver thee. And in verse 27, he confirms that again. So he is a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Darius believes this. Wonderful. He also knows that Daniel is a God, who, that Daniel's God is one who receives petitions. He was told that by the accusers. The accusers said, he's praying for other people. He's praying for us. He's praying for you, Darius. He's praying for everyone. He, so um, he knows this also. Um, he knows that he is a God who is regularly there. Again, the accuser said, he does this three times a day. So if he does this three times a day, Darius has to conclude that he is a God who is constantly there for his people. And in one of Darius's, from my point of view, one of the greatest exclamations that he makes is in verse 20 and verse 26, because he calls Daniel's God the living God. He couldn't say that about any of his hundreds of idols in the Medo-Persian Empire and all the other ones that they had conquered and the gods that they'd taken from then and the idols and so on. Daniel's only God is the one who is the living God. However, um, I don't suspect that Darius knew him personally. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't have been so anxious that night. He wouldn't have been so worried. I think if he'd been a, a, a believer in the true and living God in a personal manner, then he would have had a little bit more um, comfort, a little bit more ease, um, a little bit more rest. But no, he was anxious, um, at least at that time. Um, and he was uncertain in his question, if your God can deliver you. There was a bit of uncertainty there. Um, but... Further information is given after Daniel is delivered. He is a God who is steadfast, an unyielding God, a God who is fixed and firm, a God who is eternal. I think Darius, I think there's a change in him. I think through these events, although he knows this much about the Lord God before Daniel's in the den, the wonderful miracle, which is not a children's story. It's an adult story. Because how many of us would want to be put into a den of lions, by choice or otherwise? Um, the events afterwards, he finds that God, he is the God who is the eternal God. He confesses this in verse 26. The God who has a kingdom which is indestructible and eternal. A God, in verse 27, who is all-powerful. And finally, a God who acts miraculously. So that's one thing I wanted to, to mention just before closing, a remarkable understanding of God. And then, um, I don't think we can um, finish an SGAT meeting without mentioning prophecy. It originates from the king. 
but not a Hebrew king, but one who has invaded and occupied the promised land. Um, now we can think of Balaam. Um, again, Balaam was not a Hebrew, but at least he claimed to be a prophet. His credentials were that he was a prophet. And he... So, as it may be. Then we also have Caiaphas. Remember, Caiaphas, at least he was a Hebrew, but he was hostile to the true people of God. I said all that to say this. This prophecy is remarkable because it comes through divine personal inspiration. It is accurate and informative and truthful. We can find this, these truths in other parts of the scripture. But this comes from a man who is the head of an empire. And an empire that's not all that keen as we've seen already with all the enemies on the true and living God. Yet now this man has been touched. Especially after the events of the den. Our, go, our gracious God, in his ongoing progressive revelation of his purposes for mankind, uses even this source, Darius, to be the bearer of sacred truth. That's remarkable. That's two remarkable things. And just one final thought for us. Daniel chapter 6 prefigures, I believe, what will happen at the end of the age before our Lord returns. Although we are not experiencing the persecution now, there may be people here tonight. And Daniel 6 gives a warning of the unleashing of terrible powers of evil, waves of continuous persecution against the Lord's faithful people. It's illustrated in this passage. It's more verbal in other passages of scripture. But surely the illustration should give us tonight uh, a warning at least to beware of this and to prepare for this and to be ready for this. And not only us, but the succeeding generations that come after us. We should teach them also that there's a time coming like the time of Daniel when there will be more than one Daniel, but many Daniels that will experience what Daniel experienced, and indeed, according to other scriptures, far, far worse. There's a notable difference, however. In our passage, Daniel had a human benefactor and helper. In the future age, of tribulation, all the powers of evil and hell will be identified in the person of the Antichrist. There has been no mention of an Antichrist in that passage. Darius is not one. But in the future time, there will be one. And he will do as the Saddams and the Gaddafis have done. He will press down the persecution to his minions and to their minions to, throughout the pyramid of of, of, of evil against the sons and daughters of light. Daniel 6 teaches us what to expect now in a small way, but in a far greater way in the future also. And But Daniel 6 also teaches us how we have a great preserver behind the scenes. Amen.